In the 23rd century, the Klingons wielded a weapon which commanded fear like no other. This was the weapon that allowed the Klingons to conquer their vast empire, but it would also be a weapon that they would lose in their fall, and it would not be until a century later that that weapon would finally retake its pride of place in the Vorkang class. Hello everyone, this is Venom Geek Media here, and today we are talking about the Vorkang class from Star Trek Online. This is a request by Commander Nathaniel Mead. Now, by ways of introductory remarks, it's worth saying that there is very, very limited information out there on the Vorkang. From what I can tell, uh, the Vorkang was introduced pretty early in Star Trek Online, may have even been there at launch, and is effectively a alternative skin for the Vodcha. Star Trek Online likes to do this a lot, where they say they do alternate skins, and they say, yes, it's just a refit, and they do this ad nauseum. While there are some design cues taken from the Vodcha, as we will find out in this video, there's actually a lot more the Vorkang has in common with older classes. So, without any further ado, let's delve into it. So, let me ask you a question. Did you ever hear the tragedy of Klingon photon torpedoes? I thought not. It's not the kind of story the Federation would tell you. During the 23rd century, the Klingons maintained a fairly firm advantage in photon torpedo technology. We can see in the various uh, encounters between the Enterprise and Klingon ships that most of the time, torpedo weapons were favoured by the Klingons. Unlike Starfleet ships where torpedo weapons are kind of viewed as a secondary armament, if you look at the design language of the Klingon battlecruisers of the period, it's very clear that the photon torpedo is the primary weapon and disruptor cannons are actually a secondary. As we get into the 2270s and into the 80s, the Klingons are very much relying on torpedo weapons. And in terms of just how significant this advantage was, let's just bear in mind that in 2293, the Klingons had developed a torpedo that could be launched through a cloaking device. A kind of technology which we would not see replicated till the 2380s. Um, so suffice it to say that this was a uh, piece of technology that was incredibly advanced for their time and just shows just how far ahead Klingon torpedo technology was in this period. Now, unfortunately, the Klingons underwent something that we can only describe as a significant emotional event when their moon of praxis exploded in their face. The result of that is that the Klingons were forced to come to the negotiating table to end the Cold War with the Federation. And during these negotiations, both sides agreed to bargain away certain advantages and areas of technology that they were exploring. So the Federation agreed they wouldn't develop further battlecruiser designs, such as the George O, and the Klingons also agreed they would halt their battlecruiser development for 20 years. The Federation also said that they would give up any development of megaphaser technology. The Klingons gave up development of torpedo technology, an area of technology in which they had an advantage. The idea here was kind of to equalize the the differential between the Federation and the Klingons so that one didn't feel that the other had any kind of unfair advantage. The result of this is that during the 24th century, the Klingons invest very, very heavily into disruptor technology, and that's how we get the Vodcha, which is basically a giant disruptor cannon on the end of a long boom attached to some engines. The Klingons very much emphasised the development of disruptor technology, and in areas where they would have previously used torpedoes, they actually used disruptors. So you have the, as I say, you have the Vodcha's very heavy disruptor cannon that is basically capable of one-shotting an unshielded ship. That's something a torpedo would have been used for in the past. Uh, the Negvar has bombardment cannons on the underside. Again, this is something that you would have previously used a kind of torpedo launcher for. So, with all that in mind, 
you can see that the Klingons very much commit in the 24th century to disrupt a technology over torpedoes because they had that big gap in development and kind of lost the advantage that they had had in torpedo technologies. However, during the Dominion War, the Klingons rediscovered the advantages of using photon torpedoes. In the case of their own ship, the Torpedo Vocha, which is a very capable Vocha, it basically re replaces the Prow Heavy Disruptor with a torpedo module capable of launching multiple torpedoes at once, and then on the back is a hangar bay. Uh, at the same time, they're also looking at a ship like the Akira, which is built from the ground up as a, again, torpedo gunship, mounting numerous torpedo tubes and also serving as a platform to launch fighters. And they see just how advantageous these kind of ships are. And so basically after the war, the council decides that they want something more than just the Torpedo Watcher. The torpedo Watcher is good, it did very well, but it's kind of limited by the fact that it's built off the Vochar platform, and the Vochar platform was intended for a ship armed with a heavy disruptor cannon that was going to get stuck in to the thickest parts of the battle. Which is fine, but on a torpedo platform that is going to be hanging further back and sniping away with torpedoes and launching fighters, all that kind of armour is unnecessary and is in fact a, an impediment, it, it slows you down, it makes you more vulnerable. Particularly when you're fighting on the fringes, you need to be able to deal with the more mobile attack ships and destroyers that are inevitably going to harass you. Now, we can get all into tactics and how the uh, torpedo watchers were used during the Dominion War. Generally, they would actually be used in a relatively supporting capacity. Anyway, as I say, in the post-war era, the Council has seized the success of the Torpedo Watcher and decides that they want to develop a dedicated torpedo cruiser. The requirements they give for this torpedo cruiser are as follows. They want... they're not so interested so much in volume of fire. There's other things that can achieve that for you. And also volume of fire doesn't necessarily correspond to it's not how klingon ships were designed if you look at klingon ships of the 23rd century these ships that very heavily emphasize torpedo weaponry it was never about firing dozens and dozens of torpedoes at once that was never where they had the advantage they had the advantage in the range and accuracy of their torpedo fire by allowing their weapons to be the first and the last word in the engagement. It was the Federation that became more concerned with mounting greater numbers of torpedo launchers in order to achieve a greater rate of fire, so as to compensate for the fact that the Klingons could outrange them and were generally more accurate. Rather than fully committing to this Starfleet approach to torpedoes, where Starfleet just spams torpedoes out the wazoo, they decide they're going to recommit to accuracy of fire. And also, there's a lot of fire control systems that have been developed since the 23rd century that have made disruptors more effective at long range, and so that will work doubly well for a system that is guided. Secondly is agility. It's got to be faster than the Vocha. The Vocha is decent kind of speed, especially for a ship that's going to be attacking at medium to, cl at medium to close range. It's got the necessary speed, but if you want to be genuinely mobile and difficult to counter, you know, particularly at long range, you have to be maneuverable. You have to be able to outmaneuver the enemy scout ships and destroyers, and you need to be able to hit the enemy before they can actually respond, and that means being a lot more mobile. It also needs a good secondary armament. It also critically needs to be capable of operating independently as a raider. They want something that's very mobile, very agile, that doesn't necessarily have to operate as part of a grand fleet. The Vocher is fine in a raiding role, it will do that job, but it's a bit too slow and it's a bit heavy for a raiding role. And they want something that is genuinely dedicated towards that kind of mission, rather than forcing a Vocher into it where to be honest, it is a little bit too heavy for its own good. 
The result we get is the Vorkang class, and this is launched in the 2380s, so around about the time we see the USS Cerritos flying around. So rather than taking design cues from the Vocha, which is kind of the problem of the torpedo Vocha, is that it's basically just a Vocha with torpedoes on it, they go a little bit back in the evolution of Klingon attack cruisers, and they look at the Camarag, because the Camarag was a much more agility-focused design. It had to be, because the Camarag existed in an era where the Klingons were substantially uh, overpowered, and so they had to focus on building a design that was able to evade these larger, heavier ships. The Camarag also wasn't so devoted to being a disruptor cruiser as the Vocha was. The Camarag was built basically as the D8.2, uh, in as much as it was broadly along the lines of what they were planning before Praxis, and they just dusted those off and added certain 24th century refinements. But the result was that the Camarag was still fairly on board with the use of torpedoes. It had a burst fire torpedo launcher firing three torpedoes at once. Now, that wasn't very much and it wasn't particularly advanced, but it was a good torpedo launcher. It was an improvement in capabilities. Now, the Vorkang, like I say, it takes inspiration from the Camarag. It does things very differently because this is indeed the late 24th century and times have moved on since then. Thank, thank goodness. Okay, so what are we looking in terms of armament? We are looking at four prow torpedo tubes on the hammerhead. Again, the Klingons, they like that hammerhead design because it, it provides a very good platform for long-range sensors and long-range targeting and enables the necessary accuracy for the torpedoes. And we are looking at four separate launchers rather than any kind of burst fire launcher. The Klingons, you know, experimented with burst fire launchers with the torpedo Vodger and with the Negvar. They liked them, but they, they don't really seem worth the investment. There are also two more aft torpedo launchers. Again, nothing crazy, but that will give you a, a pretty respectable uh, rear arc of fire. This is very much the Klingons looking at the Akira and saying, okay, that's excessive. We don't quite need that because the Akira was built to take on the Borg. We're not planning on taking on the Borg so much. That's a Federation Romulan problem. That's not our problem. So we want to build a ship that is more devoted to, you know, peer-to-peer -peer combat. Do we really need the bajillion torpedo tubes that the Akira has? No. Okay, how about six? Solid, well-rounded number, gives you a good amount of redundancy as well. In terms of disruptors, we have six prow disruptors, four in the hammerhead, and two in the crook of the wings. Now, those two in the crook of the wings can be equipped with pulse disruptor cannons. This is not advised, much like the Camarag, it was tried, but most captains got shot of them as soon as they could because they were uh, too short range to be any use uh, in the environment that they often found themselves in. You also then have two beam disruptors on either side of the dorsal module. So, as I say, it's got a very different mission to Akira, it's a much more restrained armament. The Akira was definitely overkill as far as the Klingons were concerned. And also, the Klingons are always of the mentality of they're still going to build more ships than Starfleet. So for every Akira, there's going to probably be at least two Vorkangs. Not to mention all the other ships in the Klingon fleet. It's also reflective of the Klingon experience of dealing with monitor-type vessels during the Dominion War. Monitors that were able to successfully ambush and wreak havoc on advancing columns of ships or actually hide, allow the vanguard of a fleet to pass, and then as the support elements, the support and supply elements came through, hit them. And the Klingons took note of that, and that's part of what the Vorkang is intended to do. As well as this torpedo armament, we also have two large hangars underneath. These fighters and ships are generally used as an extension of the ship's sensor network rather than being an armament in and of themselves. The Klingons don't really go in for uh, bombers and gunships, not to say that it's unheard of, 
but they find that actually using them for reconnaissance is far more effective. That's where their real strengths are, especially when you've got a ship that has the reach to action that reconnaissance from a very long way away. You know, this is the late 24th century, so at this point we also have remote telemetry targeting. So a fighter can sight a target at very long range and get a target lock. It can then pass that information all the way back to the Vorkang. The Vorkang can, from well beyond sensor range, launch a volley of torpedoes and the ship can be engaged with the Vorkang's weapons without even realizing that it's under attack. Welcome to modern war. Now, there are downsides to the Vorkang. It has minimal protection. The only parts of the ship that are actually armored are the impulse engines, which just goes to show how key those things are to its survival. If it loses its impulse engines, it's dead. It's very reliant on speed and keeping range and on not being seen. And this brings us to another key feature, the improvement of stealth technologies on the Vorkang. You'll notice that the Vorkang has a very low profile. All those very geometric pieces of superstructure that you see on the Vocha are on the Vorkang uh, smoothed out in order to create a lower profile. You will also notice that the neck of the Vorkang has what looks like heat sinks and we also get an improved cloaking device. What we get with the Vorkang is much closer to a Romulan standard of stealth rather than the Klingon standard of stealth which is frankly a 23rd century standard of stealth. The emphasize on Klingon stealth has always previously been on raising and lowering the cloak as quickly as possible. The Vorkang is less concerned with that and more concerned with being undetected. Because if the Vorkang is going to attack, it's going to attack at long range, where the time it takes to drop its cloak doesn't really matter so much. Finally, we also have a little special weapon of the Vorkang. It's called an isometric disruptor. Uh, essentially, this, this conducts across a ship's shields and does damage mostly to shielding systems, but the main thing it can do is it can propagate across multiple shields in close proximity, up to three times. So it's very, very good for disrupting enemy formations, and this might seem a little bit out of the blue. But it's worth remembering that actually during the Dominion War, the Cardassians used formation, and the Klingons hated it. So the isometric disruptor was added to break up enemy formations, especially given that this ship is effectively a kind of cavalry ship. The best defense against cavalry is to bunch up and form an all-round defense. And if you do that, the Vorkang is not going to have any way in. So it needs to use the isometric disruptor to break up that formation. This also synergizes very well with other raiding craft, you know, as I say, the, the Vorkang is more intended for raiding as well. Um, and in that respect, we start breaking up enemy formations by hitting them with the isometric disruptor, and that creates the space necessary for the smaller birds of prey and raptors to get in there and start isolating and wolf packing ships one by one. And so that very neatly brings us into the employment and tactics of the Vorkang. As I say, that's one such use in the kind of raiding role. The Vorkang is still very much an attack cruiser. It's just a torpedo attack cruiser, and as such, a little bit more standoffish than its Vochar predecessor. In fleet action, it's going to snipe from the back or round the flanks, and support the capital ships. This is not a frontline ship like the Vocha. The late 24th and early 25th century battle space is far too dangerous for a ship as lightly armoured as the Vorkang, and instead it's there to support larger ships like the Moog and even larger that can take those fights on. Its real strength is in open action as a kind of nucleus for smaller raiding craft. In that way, it actually acts very similarly to the Jem'Hadar battlecruiser. That was one of the ways the Jem'Hadar battlecruiser worked, was anything that was too big for the Jem'Hadar fighters to deal with, the Jem'Hadar battlecruiser would come in 
and it's a battle cruiser so it's relatively fast and mobile and it can keep pace with that kind of open engagement and the Vorkang does that even better than the Gemitar battle cruiser could ever hope to have done. It's lighter, it's more maneuverable, it's faster, it's stealthier, it's got more torpedo launchers. So again, I think there's potentially some lessons learned from the Dominion there. So with its ability to outrange most targets, it's really best paired with light ships and it hangs back and provides the support, deals out the punishment at long range, while smaller ships like the Birds of Prey and the Raptors get in close and isolate and wolf pack individual ships. So, this leads us to the question, is the Vorkang a return to form for Klingon battlecruiser design? Certainly we can say that it exhibits a level of technological ambition which has gone unseen in nearly a century. It's really trying to retake that spot that the Klingons held in the late 23rd century. But that being said, is this niche even relevant, the long-range torpedo sniper? Is it really relevant? There are definitely advantages to a ship like that, but it is not the decisive weapon that it once would have been. In the battle space of the late 24th and early 25th century, size and firepower have become a critical factor. And this is just something that the Vorkang lacks, and you can't really compensate for that. It simply can't hang with the big boys of this period. And you may even say that large battleships are something of a technological dead end, to which you may have a point, and ships like the Vorkang may in reality prevail over uh, such designs, but... Unfortunately, the Vorkang suffers from the fact that it lives in the Klingon Empire, where image-based politics among the Great Houses simply does not favour these kind of sensible and restrained designs as much as the more impressive, gigantic battleships that we see in the 25th century. My final thoughts are this. This is a very, very well thought out and very intelligently designed ship with a very particular and critical mission in mind. It's just a shame that it fell on deaf ears. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you all enjoyed. Leave your thoughts in the comments below and I will see you all in the next video. Thank you to my members, my Navarks, Jeffrey Ballard, Tully DT, Rella and David Reeves, my commanders, Captain's Quarters, Chase Rector, PQSK, Philip Ty, Bird Monster, Jeff Hallam, Mark Philippe, Robert Sampson, Sean Farrell, Narata, Das Blas, Adam Bowman, Nathaniel Mead, DM Tribal Typhoon, Gabe Logan, Mr. Flegel, Nicholas Walsh, and Tom Zaros. And I salute my Centurions, Pendleberry, Marcus Hall, Julian Arnott, Freedom Trooper, Okokatam Quaesto, Squadra Course, John Nicole, Athy's Collection, and Tobias Klein. And I thank all my loyal sub-lieutenants. Thank you guys for supporting the channel, and I will see you all in the next video.